Good evening, everybody. Just like to share my thoughts, which are very similar to, uh, to Nora's thoughts, on this issue of how our state uh, has respected and valued children uh, during the work that I have been doing. In the 1970s, I went with two other Jesuits to live and work in Summer Hill in Dublin's inner city. What I witnessed there shocked me. The living conditions were appalling. The place was crawling with rats. There was no soundproofing between flats. Flats on the top floor, the roof leaked. I was shocked at the conditions in which people were living and in which young people were growing up. But what shocked me even more was that I had been living in Dublin and I had been totally unaware of the conditions that people lived in there. Or perhaps I didn't want to see the conditions that people lived in there. We used to say in the inner city that we could tell which children were going to end up in prison when we were baptizing them. And I think I could still say that today. Last Saturday I was in one of our prisons and I visited three brothers in the same, sharing the same cell. On other occasions I have met three generations of the same family in prison on the same day. It was working in the inner city that why we encountered a small number of children, one as young as nine years of age, sleeping on the streets. It was that that prompted me to open a hostel for young homeless people in that area. So we made a proposal to the Eastern Health Board, as it then was, for funding to open that hostel. How we got the funding and opened the hostel is really a parable for the attitude of the state to vulnerable and sometimes difficult children. The inner city was beginning to explode. There was a spate of handbag snatches, often from cars commuting along Summer Hill into the city centre. And the latest joyriding incident provided the headlines in the media day after day. I used to watch children in a stolen car passing out a guard the car, beeping the horn in order to get a chase. Starsky and Hutch, for those of you old enough to remember, <laughs> was no rival for what was happening in Dublin's inner city at that time. The government response was to open Lock and House in County Cavan as a juvenile prison, staffed by prison officers with two weeks childcare training. There was an outcry from all the agencies working with children that the sole response by government to deprived inner city children was to lock them up 175 kilometers away. So our proposal for a hostel for homeless inner city kids was lying on the desk of the Minister for Health, Charlie Hawhey, and he jumped at the chance to divert some of the criticism from the government. He ordered the health board to get the hostel up and running as quickly as possible. I had several meetings with the health board. They kept asking me when we could open, but always telling me that they disagreed with the idea of the hostel. They saw no need for the hostel, but they were under instructions to get the hostel up and running. The needs of vulnerable or poor children have never been a priority for successive governments. Despite the fact, as Nora said, that the old 1908 Child Care Act has been updated many times in the UK, it continued to be law here until 1991. When the Child Care Act of 1991 was eventually passed in Ireland, giving children a legal right to accommodation and care, it took another three years before the relevant sections of that act were signed into law by the Minister. Those, of course, being the sections which required money to implement. It then required a series of legal actions to oblige the health boards to implement the Act. In the first year after the Act was signed into law, the health boards spent two million Irish pounds defending legal actions brought by children who were simply asking that they be given the rights that they had under the Child Care Act. Children continue to be detained in St. Patrick's Institution in contravention 
of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And while I welcome the recent commitment to end the detention of children in St. Patrick's Institution, and I understood and stand that last Thursday, the last 16-year-old uh, moved out of St. Patrick's Institution, I still have to remember that it was the Whitaker inquiry into the prison system which first recommended the closure of St. Patrick's in 1985. Despite some improvements in recent years, mental health services for children are still scandalously inadequate. With, as Nora again said, 132 children, that is one third of all children admitted to psychiatric hospital care in 2011, had to be admitted to adult psychiatric wards because of inadequate provision of inpatient beds in child psychiatric wards. Most social work teams are unable to respond quickly or at all to many child welfare referrals due to lack of resources. A fire brigade service, as one social worker called it, where only the most urgent cases are responded to and the others are just put on long waiting lists, our files are closed without even being investigated. To bring us up to the level of social work service that exists in Northern Ireland, we would need another 2,000 social workers. The list goes on and on. The history of the cause for a constitutional referendum on the rights of the child also illustrates the lack of political interest. As Nora said, in 1993, Judge Catherine McGuinness, as chairwoman of, the, woman of the Kilkenny Incest Inquiry, recommended a change to the Constitution to include a statement on the rights of the child. Nothing happened. The Constitutional Review Group, established in 1995, recommended in its report the following year that the Constitution be amended to include certain rights of the child. Nothing happened. In 1998, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child found that Ireland's welfare practices and policies do not adequately reflect the child rights-based approach enshrined in the Convention on the Rights of the Child and recommended the speedy enactment of the recommendations of the 1996 Review Group. Nothing happened. In the early 2000s, an all-party committee on the Constitution were asked to review family rights and related issues, and in 2006 recommended an amendment to Article 41 to include a new section on the rights of the child. This time, something did happen. A committee was set up. The then Minister for, for Children, Brian Lenin, set up a committee to undertake a review of the Constitution to examine the status of children, which resulted in the publication of the 28th Amendment to the Constitution Bill in 2007. This led to, guess what? Another committee. The Joint Committee on the Constitutional Amendment on Children reviewed the 28th Amendment Bill and recommended an alternative wording. This led to another committee, and we are now awaiting the wording of the referendum promised in the autumn. This referendum on the rights of the child is potentially one of the most significant steps forward for children in recent years. However, I have two fears. The first is that the Department of Finance will get their hands on the wording of the referendum and ensure that it will be diluted so that it involves little or no cost to the state. In that case, I will not be able to support the referendum. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to ensure that the lives of children, particularly children who are vulnerable, are changed forever for the better. A vague or weak wording will not just be an opportunity lost, but it will set back the efforts of those who are working to improve the lives of children, often in the face of the apathy or selective concerns of the political system. My second fear is that the referendum will be strongly opposed for the wrong reasons. 
much of the opposition coming, unfortunately, from right-wing Catholic organisations who see it as an attack on the rights of the family and a way of allowing the state to take children more easily and more frequently away from their parents. However, the referendum has actually very little to do with taking children away from their family and into care. The state already has the power to do that, where there is serious neglect or abuse, except in an extremely small number of exceptional cases. The state doesn't need a referendum to do that. So the referendum is not intended to, nor should it, pit the state against parents. Indeed, the referendum should have an express statement affirming the right of every child to be cared for insofar as practicable by their parents. No, a properly worded referendum will rather support parents and families. The Children's Court in Dublin every day has parents pleading with the court for help and support. They say their child has needs that they cannot meet from their resources. They may not have the finances or the knowledge or the specialist skills to meet the needs of their children. They say that their child's behavior is out of their control and they are asking for help. Invariably, the court says there is very little they can do. A properly worded referendum on the rights of the child would therefore include an express statement that the state will facilitate children to reach their full potential by giving children rights such as the right to adequate protection, health, housing, social supports, play and recreation. If the referendum expressly gave children rights, then the state would be obliged to provide the services that would be necessary to secure their rights. For example, if the child had a constitutional right to adequate and appropriate health care, children with mental health problems could no longer be placed inappropriately in adult psychiatric wards. Children would not wait years for a psychological assessment and more years again for a service. Children who needed speech therapy would be entitled to get it in a timely fashion. Children with special needs would be entitled to an appropriate service. Children who needed a therapeutic service would get it and so on. Parents who are at the end of their tether trying to get a service for their child would now have a right to that service. Giving children rights is to support parents, not to attack them. Indeed, in the Baby Anne case, the Baby Anne case was a case where two unmarried parents felt they couldn't rear their child properly and they gave their young baby up for adoption. After two years with their foster family who were very advanced in the process of adopting the child, the two parents got married and they asked for their child back. The High Court refused, saying it was not in the best interests of the child. But they went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said that according to our Constitution, the parents had a right to have the child back, even though it was not in the best interests of the child. So in the Baby Anne case, it was the failure of the state to offer her parents adequate support in the first place to enable them to rear her that prompted them to give her up for adoption. Of course, giving children rights will cost money and therein is the rub. A referendum on its own won't make the slightest difference unless it gives children rights and ensures that the services and resources which are necessary to meet those rights are provided. Services which frequently now do not exist or for which there are excessively long waiting lists. The Constitution should be the fundamental statement of our values as a nation and the foundational document affirming the basic rights which our society pledges to uphold and to protect. 
And yet we must remember that the two biggest dangers facing children today and from which children need to be protected are poverty and inadequate housing. The referendum I would like to see, but I'm not going to see it, would affirm as an inalienable and non-negotiable value Irish society's commitment to ensuring that our children would grow up in appropriate housing free from poverty. It would therefore give children the right to be protected from both. Hence a proper referendum would see the government whose policies have created the problems of poverty and housing, which many children face, giving children rights which would require the government to change its policies. What hope is there of that happening? So the referendum I would like to see is not going to happen. But are there some signs of hope? I think there are, and Nora has mentioned some of them. Can the referendum be a major step in the right direction? I think and I hope it will be. The current minister, Francis Fitzgerald, is certainly committed to reform of the childcare system. I have the greatest respect for you, Minister. If you can't do it, nobody can do it. But will the coalition last that long? <laughs> I remember uh, Nora mentioned one of the signs of hope is that you now sit at the cabinet table. I remember Frank Fahey was one of the early junior ministers for uh, children. But Frank had no uh, right, to, Frank wasn't sitting at the cabinet table. And then he was promoted to be minister of fisheries. And now that he had responsibility for our fish, he was entitled to sit at the cabinet table. <laughs> so we have moved on some considerable way. Can you, <clears throat> again, the new Child and Family Agency, which will replace the childcare section of the HSE in 2013, offers a lot of hope. The HSE was incapable of focusing adequately on childcare issues. Given the crises in A&E, hospital budgets, and so many other urgent problems within the health service which kept arising. The Child and Family Agency will have a dedicated budget, hopefully an adequate one, and will have a line of accountability which is badly lacking in the current structure. Pending closure of the wing of St. Patrick's housing 16 and 17 year olds is also welcome and long overdue. It was one of the first promises made by the new director of the Irish Prison Service, another man for whom I have great respect, and hopefully it will proceed as planned. There's a long way to go before Ireland can be, as the Bernardo's mission statement says, the best place in the world for a child to grow up. However, a suitably worded referendum on the rights of the child would be a very important step in that direction.